Bill, you've had a career in institutional asset management for over 30 years and have been at the helm at Kaya during a period of tremendous growth. I would love to hear your perspective on growth of alternatives globally. Well, I, I think the outlook uh, in terms of absolute growth is exceedingly positive, but I think we've got to measure some of that opportunities against some of the risks. And, and I look at a couple of trends which we're going to touch upon today, and uh, one of them is uh, the retirement promise. And uh, I look at my dad as an example. He's 90 years old, Canada life. Uh, he retired when he was about my age, still alive, 91 years old, gets a, a, a paycheck in the mailbox every two weeks, I think might maybe indexed to inflation. So uh, he never had to worry about investment risk. He never had to worry about longevity risk. Somebody took care of that for him. Uh, around uh, 1980 or so, as a consequence of a tax act coming out of Congress, uh, there was a provision in there called 401k in the United States, and it allowed corporate America to kind of dance away from this uh, retirement uh, promise where they could take the responsibility off their balance sheet and they say to the individual, here's a list of offerings. I'm going to throw a little bit of a matching contribution uh, at it, but the longevity risk and investment risk are all on you. And that was done with very little in the way of, of training wheels. Uh, and on top of that, and we're going to get into this more, that access really meant access to a money market fund, public equities, and public fixed income. And that was it. Another interesting trend, and I think these are both uh, colliding, is what's going on in the private markets, which is the new home for capital formation. And that's really been in play, probably starting uh, around the GFC, and that's accelerating where really we're seeing the, the uh, capital formation value creation happening in those private markets. These companies are staying private longer, and by the time they're going public, and I'll give you a couple examples, uh, Spotify and then most recently Coinbase, both of those companies were private for over uh, a decade. In both cases, I think over 12 years. And when they came public, they came public as DPOs, direct public offerings, which means, a pretty simple explanation, the selling principles, the founding GPs, the founding LPs are selling to the public market participants, dollar for dollar. They're not looking to raise any new capital. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be another leg of value creation, but when they're selling, that should at least be a flashing yellow light. Uh, I'll contrast that to Google, which started as a company uh, in 1998 and went public uh, about six years later, so about half the time. And they needed to get public because they needed to get access to the capital in those private markets. And, and Google has said it went public uh, almost uh, 20 years ago. So we're seeing this capital formation and the flow of capital more and more in these in the private markets. And the need to be a public company is not as acute as it once was. So this trend is not going to reverse itself. And I think the growth that that means certainly in private equity and private debt is going to be enormous. But we're probably going to touch upon infrastructure, which has been newsworthy here in the U U.S. with Biden, uh, that, that that's a space we're going to see a tremendous amount of flows to as well. So I, I saw some of the frequent numbers and and I, I'm assuming that's probably the base case. And there's only upside in terms of asset growth from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're seeing growth across private market asset classes across the board with private equity leading the pack. And as a longtime advocate for investor education, what do you feel that retail investors need to understand about private equity? Well, I th I, we talk about private equity a lot. And uh, I get out of college in 1982. And back in the good old days of 1982, the endowment model, which drove the investing at the Harvards and the Yale endowments, uh, was only about 20 years old and just getting started. And at that point in time, in the early 80s, there were only 24 general partners in the entire world, not just the US and the world. So think about the asymmetric information and the ability to get access to these private companies with no competition, no auction. The entry multiples were very, very low and the world was their oyster. So it was a tremendous opportunity. And I think, again, some of the frequent numbers, I think they're now talking about over 8,000 funds in this space. And, uh, and there's probably as least as many GPs and maybe more. Uh, so this market has gotten more efficient. Uh, and by more efficient, uh, if you look at some of the data, I think PitchBook may be frequent to put this out. Entry multiples, entry, not exit, in many cases are over 20 times EBITDA. So the GP helpers are going to have to help a lot to really get that EBITDA number up to a reasonable level and hopefully sell it something more than 20 times cash flow. So it's gotten much more complex. And I think when you're talking about private equity, I think you really got to be talking about it as a very complex industry. It's no longer an asset class. 
And if you're going to treat it as uh, walking down aisle number five in the investment grocery store and fill up your cart with 20 percent uh, in the basket of private equity, it's not going to end so well. Uh, and you're going to be lucky if that's your approach to do better than the public market proxy. Totally agree. Uh, I mean, private equity has long been held by institutions. How, in your view, has access changed to private equity and perhaps private markets in general? Well, it, it's developing and I think it has to accelerate. And the hard thing is how you do it and how you have the ongoing commitment to transparency and education with a less sophisticated investor. Uh, as I said before, these two trends, the fact that the retirement responsibility is on you and me as individuals, and the fact that capital formation is happening in that private market. So it seems crazy to say that, uh, again, I'll, I'll pick my dad as an example, that uh, he didn't have to worry about access to private equity or private debt. Somebody else took care of that for him. But when you're saying now it's your responsibility, but you've got to build a portfolio, which is two alternatives and maybe three money markets, public equity, public fixed income at a time where certainly in these moving cycles, but uh, public fixed income is a horrible, horrible place to be. I just saw a quote in the Financial Times just this week that the high yield index in Europe is now trading or yielding about uh, 230 basis points. Inflation is 300 basis points. You don't have to be a math major to realize that's a 60 basis point negative yield to maturity. So, uh, and that's high yield. And you have to recognize, am I being compensated for the risk I'm taking to get a negative real return? And, if, and the more you get into corporates uh, and, and govies, it, the worse it gets. So we've got to find ways of giving, giving investors greater access to more than just these three alternatives. Uh, and I don't see that how there's any other way around that, uh, but how we do it is a big question mark and getting an ongoing commitment uh, from folks like uh, you that this matters, education matters. And if we don't do that right, it's going to end very badly for the end investor. I totally agree with you. And education is of paramount importance to us at McKenzie. Education with advisors to educate their clients, working in partnership with advisors to democratize access to private markets, broaden the opportunity set for end users. It's critical to future growth and I agree with everything you said about the transformation from DB uh, to DC and how that impacts indeed access to and use of public versus private markets investments.